Okay, so I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome to, the, to one of the afternoon sessions. My name is uh, David Borshoff. I'm the Director of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at St John of God Murdoch Hospital and uh, the WA State Chairman of the ASA. So firstly, I just ask you to switch your mobiles off and we'll, as before, I think we'll have questions at the end. And uh, so if you can use the app and fire the questions through, I've got my little iPad here and uh, I'll be able to ask them. So I'll, this session is uh, close to my heart on uh, patient safety and error prevention. And as anesthesiologists, I think uh, we all understand that we lead the way, a, a fact that I like to remind my surgical colleagues of frequently. Our first speaker, I'm sure, doesn't need another introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. I did a little brief uh, run through of some of his publications before I came here today, and I got about halfway and had to have a cup of tea and lie down. Uh, he's extremely qualified. He's a specialist in uh, anesthesia and intensive care medicine. Professor Avery Tung is currently the quality chief of the Department of Anesthesia at the University of Chicago, and he's president of the Society of Critical Care Anesthesiologists, as well as being the executive editor for critical care and resuscitation for the Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia. So I look forward to uh, hearing his talk on the challenges um, with improving uh, anesthesia quality. So I'll hand it over to you, Professor Tung. Okay, good afternoon. Well, I guess I'm here to talk about uh, anesthesia quality. I'm gonna go ahead and start, uh, really sort of with a skeptical look, I'm gonna go ahead and start with a few um, disclosures. I am the current president of the Society for Critical Care Anesthesiologists. Uh, critical care is my subspecialty, so I will vigorously defend uh, those willing to care for high-risk, high-mortality patients which can drag down your outcome statistics. Uh, I am the critical care section editor for ANA, and so they pay me to be skeptical, particularly about people who will tell you that quality is easy. And I'm here to say, beware those who say, oh, it's easy, you just have to do this. In fact, quality is a nasty, difficult job. The rock is always falling back down the hill, and it's only made bearable by the idea that one day you get to retire and don't have to do it anymore. Uh, lastly, I'm the quality chief for my department, and I'm thus very familiar with strategies for meeting quality measures. You know, I go to meetings with uh, other quality chiefs, you know, and we go to the quality hospital quality meeting, and I don't envy others either. You know, my job is hard, but so are theirs. The medicine quality chief must wrestle with factors he or she can't control. The surgery quality chief has to herd cats. Uh, the problem for me is twofold. The first is, what do you measure? You know, what metrics govern quality anesthesia? And the second, how do you track outcomes outside your world? Uh, here's an example of how hard that first question is. You know, if you had to choose just one of these to say this represents my quality as an anesthesiologist, which one of these would you choose? And I've ordered these all the way from uh, what we would call structural measures at the top down to uh, outcome measures at the bottom, you know, and uh, none of these really fit the bill, do they? You know, whether you're put your pulse oximeter on the finger before induction, does that really mark you as a quality anesthesiologist or is it your post-op AKI rate, which um, let's be uh, real, it's not very easy to affect as an anesthesiologist, particularly when you run that out to 30 days like many of current quality metric uh, analyses do. It's also a bigger problem because if you just look out to the end of the anesthesia horizon, which generally is you know, when the patient leaves the PACU or that first day afterwards, you find that that is not when most of the action is. And it was uh, Dan Susser at ASA last year who mentioned, at, you know, at American Society meeting last year, who mentioned that really a lot of the action happens after the first post-operative day. And when I looked in our hospital, that's correct. When you look at um, patients who have died, and this is my mortality reports within seven days of surgery, and you stratify by the day that they've died, what you see is very few people, roughly three to 4% die in the first zero post-operative day zero. Nearly everybody dies on post-operative days one to seven. So really to find you know, where you can make a difference, you have to extend your horizon out to a good seven days. And doing that is much, much harder than just looking narrowly at the first post-op day. If you look there, you're gonna be missing nearly everything of what matters. Moreover, if you look at the patients who die in post-op day zero, and these are our data from uh, the date span of um, 2004, 14 to 16, as you see below, you know, there's really not a lot of quality uh, that you can get out of those cases. Many of them were almost moribund by the time they came to the OR. Uh, it was Donna Beatin who first then described the nature of, of, of quality structure. You know, this is his seminal article in JAMA in 1986, where he described uh, that 
care and equality could be divided into three broad categories, structure, process, and outcome. Um, he says it right there. He says, you know, if you sort of think of quality as the structural elements, process elements, and outcome elements, you've pretty much covered all the different bases. And of structure, he said, you know, but uh, he said, we really don't know what that can do. And I think what is remarkable about this article, even though everybody heralds it as the dawn of quality in medicine, you know, it's very, very subversive. That, you know, Don Abedin is unsure of the impact of anything of what he said, and he lays it right out there on the page. Here he says, we really don't know the relationship between structural characteristics and the process of care. And uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, we actually don't know a lot at all about how structural process measures relate to anesthesia quality. Um, I've shown you this slide before, but this is a look at a uh, safety checklist. That's a structural measure. It's how you do something, you know, and the relationship between this surgical safety checklist and quality is not at all clear. Some studies say yes, other studies say no. Here's an example, one that says no. You know, and uh, here's another structural measure. Whether you have intensivists in the house at night, many believe that it improves quality. You know, many uh, hospital administrators are asking for it, but when you look at the actual data, it's very, very hard to find a beneficial effect, that the relationship between a structural measure such as having a nighttime intensivist and whether that improves outcome, that's sort of very, very thin. It's certainly not easy to find if it's there at all. Uh, Don Bean moved on to talk about process measures, and if you flip all the way down, you see where he says that. But when he talks about process measures, what he mentions, he says, well, you know, in truth, what we know about the relationship between the technical aspects of the care we provide and outcome, you know, uh, is of dubious quality. It's not very clear that we know that changing process really changes outcome, and that makes another, that makes an assessment of management of anesthesia quality difficult as well. Uh, in the United States, we definitely know that that is true. We are at the tail end of an eight-year experiment in process measures, and that was the uh, United States Surgical Care Improvement Project, uh, a basket of process measures, and I've listed some of those for you there, you know, which are required for hospitals to report. So everybody had to report their performance on these measures to uh, the government in order to uh, get uh, their Medicare reimbursement, and so we all got very good at meeting these measures is what we got. But whether it changed quality or not is a different story. Um, at the time, it's instructive sort to look back to 2006 and, you know, how naive we were at that time because we thought it definitely would do something, and, you know, that, you know, all of these measures, evidence-based in terms of the relation, in terms of small studies, that we thought that they would actually improve quality. It was very, very surprising when it turned out that they did not. And here's a uh, tip sheet that was sent out by the U.S. government in 2006, heralding the beginning of the Surgical Quality Improvement Project. Uh, and you can see, you know, I've lifted a sentence out of there, antibiotics should be given within 60 minutes before surgery. Given Given properly, they can greatly lower your chances of getting an infection after surgery. Today, we know nearly none of that is true. Uh, this is just one of a series of papers finding no relationship between the timing of preoperative antibiotics and the outcomes you get from that. This paper was actually brought to me by a vascular surgeon celebrating the end of the Surgical Care Improvement Project in 2014. He said, well, we're about the journal club this article that says that the whole thing, the whole last eight years were one long nightmare. Uh, maybe so, maybe not, but what you can see is that for open AAA repairs, for example, you know, after the implementation of the Surgical Care Improvement Project metric, the six, within 60-minute 60 metric, uh, infection rates actually went up. My personal favorite is this one. Uh, if there's any surgical care improvement project metric, any process metric that you think would improve outcomes, it would be the idea that DVT prophylaxis reduces the instance of DVTs and therefore PE. But that's not true. When you align these two metrics together by hospital uh, on the x-axis there, you know, um, how good you are at um, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. On the y-axis, how many DVTs you have, you see there is very little relationship. That's to say, it doesn't matter whether you're not, you're not very good, you're really very good, you know, your instance of DVT seems to be the same, very, very striking. Now, for a quality person, it's very, very frustrating to imagine that just changing process is not going to get you any further. You know, it's so frustrating because you, it doesn't seem fair that quality should be so hard to achieve. You know, that changing structure and changing process should improve their associate outcomes, shouldn't they? But in truth, you know, as you should the, 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 you should think of it the other way around. That is very unlikely that improving a process uh, will improve the associated outcome. In fact, it's more common that that's not the case. Um, why doesn't it happen? Well, there are a couple of reasons that may be. You know, one is that hospitals don't care. Uh, about the relationship between uh, quality and process measures. Uh, this is one example of that. Uh, Dr. Glick and I, we published this in 2015, a look at performance in hospital quality measures as a 
um, function of their competitiveness. That is to say, how many hospitals were within a 20-mile uh, radius of them. And when we aligned these hospitals, we looked at different quartiles of competition. And what you can see is that hospitals do not compete on quality, at least not in the United States. It's just not something they care about, and by extension, not something that patients care about. You can see for every single one of the quality measures we looked at, uh, there was no relationship between competitive quartile and performance on these quality measures. Uh, we commented at the end that hospitals probably do not compete meaningfully on quality measures. Well, the only thing we did find was that in more competitive environments, the costs of care were higher, which sort of seems very anti-invisible hand. Um, even more worrisome is the idea that uh, the data supporting process measures uh, may not be as solid as we are led to believe. And this is uh, a um, AHRQ white paper uh, sort of prepared analyzing Cochrane reports and asking the interesting question, you know, as data accumulated over time, you know, did the um, effect size become clear immediately in um, Cochrane reports for which there was a significant finding or did they not? Uh, or put another way, did treatment effects remain stable as new evidence accumulated? You would think that if the signal were really there, if it were really true, then papers would lock onto it early and subsequent papers would just refine what had already been seen. But in fact, what they found was the opposite. They found that uh, the expectations were way too optimistic for Cochrane reviews with a very high strength of evidence that the literature took a long time to converge to that strength of evidence. And for um, papers with a very low strength of evidence, the literature took really about the same amount of time to converge to that strength of evidence. So just because the last 10 years have shown us that this might be true, there's no guarantee that eventually the Cochrane report that bubbles out of that body of literature is going to say there's a strong strength of evidence. They're just as likely to say there's no effect at all. Um, finally, you know, there's the possibility process measures may not improve outcome because what you have to do to get that process measure to turn out well uh, defeats the entire purpose of the measure. And so this is uh, the UHC, the University Health Consortium. It's a group of academic hospitals who share quality data. We at the University of Chicago, we belong to it. And this is my login page. And every now and then, I have to go here to find out, you know, how we're doing. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, our, this is maybe 2011. This is our performance in the glucose control after cardiac surgery metric. And for those of you who don't know, it's that the glucose at 6 in the morning had to be below 180 for the first post, two post-operative days, uh, which when you think about it is very, very hard to achieve because it means you have to measure that glucose at 3 in the morning so that you can intervene at 4 in the morning to get the glucose at 6 in the morning to be where it needs to be. Very, very hard, but what you see here is a resounding success. See, we've got the coveted double green dot here, which means that we did really, really well. In fact, we were one out of 95 hospitals for a full, um, for a full six months, you know, at the top of the UHC cooperative. You know, am I proud of that? Well, maybe. I'm going to tell you what we did to get that, and then you tell me whether I should be proud of that or not. See, it wasn't really always that way, and this is, uh, we had a process control chart to see how we were doing, and you can see that we were up and down and up and down, you know, and then we had a particularly downtime here, you know, and right around here we became very frustrated, the pharmacist and I, about how we were ever going to solve the problem of controlling glucose on the first two post-operative days, short of staying up all night, which is what our pharmacist uh, experimentally did. There was no obvious way to make that happen, but what we said is, you know, Maybe it doesn't make a difference. So we reviewed uh, most of our data. You know, we looked at 188 patients over six months, compared the failures to the successes, and we found no difference in length of stay or infection. And I said, well, that's cute. You know, let's turn that into an abstract. And so it became an abstract at ASA, and this was 2011 in Chicago. And I was at a committee meeting when this uh, abstract was presented across the street uh, at the, in the convention center in Chicago. Um, the person who was there, who was uh, Jenna Cast, you know, one of our pharmacists, she said, Avery, nobody came to see our abstract. I'm like, well, okay, you know, I don't expect anybody to come. It's an abstract on glucose for Pete's sake. Who's going to show up? But it turned out that somebody did show up. Actually, someone did show up, and that was the anesthesiology news, you know. And about two weeks later, after the ASA had completed, they called me and said, Avery, you know, we'd like to write a, uh, an article on your abstract. I'm like, which abstract? You're like, the one that says that uh, there's no difference in outcome between the ones who succeed with the, ion with the glucose control measure and the ones who fail. I said, okay, sure. Let's do that. And so we had an interview, and they wrote an article, and it was a really big one here. You know, and uh, what was I going to say? I couldn't say that the, you have a stupid metric. Instead, I said that really, you know, it's not apparent what the risk factors are. It may be that there's more than just glucose that plays a role in perioperative infections. Maybe the glucose doesn't do anything at all. But I got the idea. I said, you know, that's sort of interesting because um, 
if anesthesiology news is interested, then other people are going to be interested as well. So why don't we turn this into a paper? We won't just leave it in an abstract. We'll turn it into a paper. We'll gather some more data. We'll do some statistics. We'll make it a paper. And you haven't seen that paper. And the reason why uh, is this, because this is a, you know, a presentation at ASA. This is a publication of anesthesiology news. And this is a bad uh, week. You know, it was a bad week where we had many, many INF4 failures. Glucose is greater than 180 in the day of surgery. You know, and the hospital said, listen, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you fix it, you know, because we don't want to see this anymore. As you can see, we fixed it and thus began our six-week run at the top of the UHC cooperative. You can see hotline there in red. Now, if you do cardiac ICU work at all, you know how we fix it, because there's only one way to solve this measure, and that is to keep the patient in the ICU for both postoperative days, no matter what they look like, because that's the only way you can monitor glucose tightly enough to keep it below 180 for the period uh, that's in question, particularly when they begin to mobilize and begin to eat. There's no other way to do it except to run that insulin drip continuously, measure glucoses every hour by finger stick, and that's what we did, and boy, it does work. But you know, you have to ask the question, is that the best way to take care of patients? We literally had patients um, trading stocks on their iPad, walking back and forth, almost lifting, practically lifting weights, and still in the ICU because that was the only way to control their glucose and make that measure. So um, I actually, for, for fun, I did a calculation. I said, let's see how much it costs us, you know, and is that actually worth it financially for us to meet this measure? Because keeping patients in the ICU backed up all the way through into the OR, so people were waiting in the OR while we had this done. But we were successful. We kept it at the top of the measure. Um, don't just take my word for it, that there's no obvious outcome. Uh, others have published this work. This is uh, a publication uh, with roughly the same methodology as ours, comparing successes in the glucose control measure to failures. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where these uh, authors are from because uh, this rate is uh, high enough to get the dreaded single red dot, which means they're not doing well compared to their peers. Uh, but as you can see, there was no relationship between whether patients were successfully compliant with the quality measure or not, uh, that their outcomes were essentially the same, except for potentially for this atrial fibrillation here, and that's in the wrong direction, where patients who are skip compliant were more likely to have atrial fibrillation than those who were not. You know, so there's another paper just like this. It's very, very clear that compliance with that glucose measure doesn't get you any better outcomes than not compliance with the measure. So you have have to wonder, boy, that's sort of disappointing. You know, I wonder what's going on. Particularly entertaining to me was uh, the uh, endocrine consultant that the hospital uh, sort of, you know, brought in to help us meet this measure because they wanted it because they had to report it publicly to the hospital. And that uh, endocrinologist, when I explained to him exactly what we had to do, he said, "Are you nuts? He said, Does that work?" Uh, he said, literally, he said, "I'd like to see the evidence for these guidelines myself because I have a hard time believing that they matter this much." He said, "By the way, Avery, have you seen this paper?" I said, "No, I haven't, but now I have, and I'll show it to you too." The idea that if you tightly control glucose, then the risk of cardiac arrhythmias is, is higher in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk. A paper in anesthesiology just a, a year and a half ago finding that if you tightly control glucose, the risk of delirium is also higher. So it's not at all clear that controlling glucose was uh, effective or good for patients. You know, and uh, I would intermittently go on the uh, glucose control listserv, which is, uh, you know, um, which was kept up by the UHC cooperative uh, to see what others were doing. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that people do when meeting the measure is what you need to do to get paid. Uh, this was a slide from a hospital I'm not going to name, but here's what they said. They said, you know, um, the problem is, is that we're letting people eat. So we're not going to let people eat anything. Or if we do, we're not going to let them eat anything with sugar in it. So no sugar until they meet the measure, because that's the only way to make it. And you can imagine, you've just survived cardiac surgery, you've made it through a double valve, your eyes are open, you haven't stroked, and they extubate you, and you want something to drink, and say, well, I'm sorry, water is all you get. Is it good? Is it bad? That's a good question. I'll leave that for you to uh, sort of ponder just for a while. But we found no benefit to controlling glucose in the ISU, nor has anybody else who's ever studied it, um, uh, whether patients meet or fail the skip measure. Finally, there are outcomes. Um, and outcomes sort of bring in a whole host of problems by themselves, and here are four of them. The first is whether it's possible to measure anything. Uh, even in the American foot in National Football League in the United States, where we have eight different high-def cameras, it's often people argue for days as to whether something was a catch or was not a catch. We don't have anything like that in medicine. In fact, the first thing that happens when an adverse event occurs is people turn off the infusion pump. 
uh, and then you have no idea what happened. Uh, what's a good outcome? It's not so easy. I'm going to talk a little bit about definition and finally the unintended consequences of outcome reporting. But let me start you know, with the idea that it's not so easy to figure out what happened. Not so easy at all. This is a, a paper we published uh, with Dr. Glick and Frank Dexter you know, uh, in ANA in 2010. Uh, our goal was initially to identify reasons for, for cancellation. You know, Dr. Dexter conv convinced us that that wasn't a good goal, that we should really ask the question, if you have something that's highly likely to be canceled, should you put it at the end of the day where it doesn't matter anymore, it doesn't affect the schedule. But the finding I want to highlight is that when a cancellation occurred, we would immediately call the surgeon, call the nurse, call the anesthesiologist, and find out why the cancellation happened. And what we found is that fully in 30% of cases, we couldn't figure out why the case was canceled. That's to say the surgeon will blame the anesthesiologist, and they blame the nurse, and the nurse will blame the anesthesiologist. Everybody blames each other. You know, but the reasons were so uh, ambiguous that it was not possible to identify a single cause of cancellation. I know that seems weird. You know, and it took a while for me to convince Dr. Dexter that that was the case. But I gave him an example like this. Here's an example, and you tell me whose fault this is. A patient scheduled for outpatient surgery early in the day. Because of an equipment delay, she waits most of the day, then tells the surgeon, to cancel because she does not want to wait any longer. She wants to go home. And the question is, whose fault is that? It's the patient who said cancel. It's the surgeon who actually did the canceling. It was the hospital who caused the delay. Fully one out of every three cases in this study were like that. We finally gave up with our idea that we could actually measure cancellation because you have to decide, educate, which among these reasons is the real reason why the patient was canceled. When you ask the question, if I'm going to measure outcomes, the question then becomes, okay, you're going to measure outcomes. What's the target? You know, what target are you going to choose? You know, and these studies suggest, or this amalgam of studies suggests, that it's very, very hard to choose an ideal target for what you should be aiming at. For example, if you have ARDS and you're looking at a mortality rate, I've assembled a series of studies here, and you can see that variance in the mortality that should be expected with ARDS is very, very, very high across a number of years and across a number of studies. Uh, this finding is even worse for ICU delirium, what should your delirium rate be? You, know, you might even wonder that any uh, clinical condition that varies from 10% to 90% from one ICU to another has a lot of issues that you need to sort of resolve on the back end. Here's what we do uh, in our hospital. This is our uh, AKI rate stratified by attending. And so you can see each column here is an attending from the best AKI rate to the worst AKI rate or the highest. If you see here, it's got that characteristic caterpillar look. You know, and uh, what we've learned from uh, this AKI rate is that the cardiac anesthesiologist gets screwed. This is the mean here. But when you sort of stratify by who does what, you see that the lesson of this graphic is that if you don't want to have AKI, you should have a pain or OB specialist do your anesthetic. Because once the cardiac guys get a hold of you, your chance of having AKI is much, much higher. Um, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But it's also uh, true for reintubation. You know, it's the cardiac people who get nailed. And that's because their patients are sicker, so they have more post-operative outcomes. Uh, you might interpret this graphic to say that the pain or OB specialist should do your anesthetic if you don't want to be reintubated. Or you might interpret that the patients that the cardiac ICU guys take care of is uh, harder. I should mention for both of these, the mean values are sort of at or below the literature, so we're proud of that. What we just worry about is that the cardiac people continuously get hurt. In fact, it took me a while to identify a metric where cardiac anesthesiologists do not end up on the short end of the stick, but I finally found one. It's this one. First PACU pain score greater than 7. If you never take your patients to the PACU, you will not score in this metric. Uh, what's really tremendously, I mean, a delicious little bit of um, irony, uh, you can see that pain dogs here are sort of above the median in terms of their management of pain. So it may be that cardiac people have a high instance of death and reinnovation, and pain dogs have a high instance of pain because they do the difficult cases uh, and we do not. Um, if you argue that risk adjustment is a strategy to try to get around that, it's very, very difficult to come up with a single risk stratification strategy that works. In fact, there's never going to be enough data to make that happen. Here's one study from the New England Journal comparing more expected mortality rates among six different um, risk adjustment paradigms. And what you can see here is uh, there was very, very poor agreement between methods in classifying hospital performance, even more worrisome that of 28 hospitals in 2006 with higher than expected mortality, Almost half of them were simultaneously classified by other stratification measures as having lower than expected mortality. So if you have two different risk stratification methods and they give you diametrically opposite results, then it's very hard to adjust for outcomes. Um, it was very, very clear that you could get discordant impressions about relative hospital performance. 
Uh, and as this paper suggests, uh, you know, you can now go to the literature if you want to know how to game the system to uh, make things better. Um, in this uh, study of 2,900 hospitals, they hypothesized what would happen if you recoded patients with pneumonia as even having sepsis or respiratory failure. Would your pneumonia performance improve? And the answer is heck yes. You know, if you don't have any pneumonia, then you know, you're gonna, clearly gonna do better. In fact, recoding pneumonia as either sepsis or respiratory failure gets you to, you, know, you get a 200 point, uh, 200 point jump in your rank among different hospitals. It's easy to see you know, that how you code things makes a tremendous bit of difference, you know, and it leads to more gaming than you'd like to see. Now, there are also adverse uh, consequences uh, to outcome measurement, uh, and that is that people stop risking because they don't want to have a bad case on their record. Uh, and you can see that in the performance of uh, cardiologists uh, looking to perform percutaneous coronary interventions. In this 2005 study, uh, they compared Michigan hospitals where there is no uh, quality reporting by outcome with uh, New York hospitals where there is. And you can see that in patients uh, with cardiogenic shock that there is much, much higher um, willingness in Michigan to cath them than there is in uh, New York, because in New York you say, if I cap that person, then the person dies, and it's gonna be on me, and I don't want that. Uh, more recently, the same is observed in Massachusetts, and uh, there are 31,000 patients in Massachusetts which just became uh, a uh, outcome reporting state with respect to PCI. You can see that the result of that post-reporting effect was to dramatically lower the incidence of patients uh, who got PCI for cardiogenic shock. So by instituting outcome reporting, you know, you put everybody under a microscope, the natural tendency is to not take care of the patients who are sick. All right, I've got six minutes left, and uh, you know, you say, well, Avery, it's easy to tear something down, so what are your ideas? You know, how are you supposed, what do you think we're gonna do about quality? The first thing I'll comment is that quality clearly exists in the consistency of a hospital performance, and this is a study that I like quite a bit. This is from 2013, you know, and the question they asked was, they said, well, you know, if you just look at performance on heart failure, MI, and pneumonia process measures, does that predict overall hospital mortality performance, either in medical situations or in surgical situations, and the answer is yes, it does. Those hospitals performing well in heart failure, MI, and pneumonia metrics also perform well in terms of mortality, both in terms of medical uh, and surgical. In fact, if this is uh, your odds ratio for uh, mortality, and this is if you're a large hospital, um, you can see that um, being a large hospital improves your overall mortality, improves your surgical mortality. You can see that if you're a teaching hospital, you get maybe a slight bump there also. But if you perform well on heart failure, MI, and pneumonia metrics, you have a big jump. That is to say you perform much, much better than not. So it's clear quality exists. The only question is sort of how you find it. And every now and then a paper comes across my desk that I think represents quality tremendously well. And here's one of them. Uh, this uh, came from the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Hans sent this to me. He said, you know, here's what happened to us. You know, we were using albumin for our liver transplants, and then we reviewed the literature, decided starch would be cheaper, so we went there. Uh, and then in a monthly meeting with a uh, multidisciplinary meeting with our surgeons, the transplant pharmacists, and so on, we found that uh, our AKI rate was going up. And so the surgeons, they had already looked into their own techniques and thresholds for operative uh, and hepatic flow dopplers. And this is a quality example. Instead of blaming the other person, the first thing you do is say, did I do anything wrong? Finding nothing, uh, obvious, they asked if anything had changed in terms of our management. We didn't have a response, and that's when we looked into the data. And eventually, the whole thing boiled down to an odds ratio of about 1.15 for an increased use of renal, uh, increased instance of AKI with the use of starch and liver transplant. And I thought this was so good. You know, I wrote to Dr. Hand, I said, boy, you know, that's quality in a nutshell. Now, how else can you sort of find out quality? You know, many people make fun of the just be careful metric. You know, just say, well, just be more vigilant. You know, that's not gonna work. But if you're vigilant in a directed way, I think it can work very, very well. Um, we have an app for identifying uh, high-risk processes. You can see right here, there's my uh, sort of reporting app. It allows uh, anybody in our department to report to a central source, and we get these reports, and then we can feed them back to people. Uh, here's an example of a bed that is locked, except that it still moves. And what happened was a patient went to ground, you know, and the first thing you think is, what an idiot, didn't they lock the bed? But they did lock the bed, and you can see how this bed is still moving. How would you know unless you knew? And so now we have a whole plan to stand around the bed so nobody, you know, everybody makes sure the bed stays in one place while you move them around. Uh, this picture is, uh, initially it's amusing, then it's sort of, um, and then you get horrified at what could happen. This is a um, MRI safe oxygen container, but it's located, it's sort of contained in a holder that is clearly not MRI safe. So someone took this picture, sent it to us, and that's led to a 
you know, significant hospital change because you can just imagine what happens if this thing is brought into an MRI container. We create wordles to try to um, sort of familiarize our staff with what is important so they can, be, they can know what to be aware of. You can see PACU there is a big thing, and this is the um, 2017. Uh, PACU is much smaller, and you know, Epic showed up here for the first time in almost five years because they upgraded it, and every time they upgrade Epic, people complain. Um, now, you can say, well, these are only just one-offs. And, you know, I don't know is that how exactly is that supposed to work. You know, Avery, uh, there's no data, there's no analysis. But, you know, I think behavior change is very easy to get to. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. You know, this is a classic experiment. But the idea here is to show you behavior change. The monkey on the left is trading a rock for a cucumber. And the monkey on the right is trading a rock for a cucumber. Now, watch what happens when the monkey on the right, he gives a rock. And instead of the cucumber, he gets a grape. Monkeys love grapes. The one on the left says, oh, is that right? I'm going to try that too. Here's the rock and give me my grape. But that monkey gets a cucumber, thinks about it, and says, you know something? The hell with that. <laughs> no, I, I don't, where is my grape? Give me my grape. I need my grape. You know, see, there, no, you don't need p-values, confidence intervals, you know. The monkey just has to see this is the way it is. This is ecological rationality. This is how the world works, and, you know, I, I need a grape. Now I know what to do. Finally, with two minutes left, I just make a comment. You know, I see this all the time. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, but first of all, that's not what Deming said. Instead, he said it is wrong to suppose that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And in fact, nearly everything that's worth managing is very, very difficult to measure. You know, but the statement itself is false. I'm going to see if I can disprove it for you this way in the last minute I have. You can't measure how good looking you are, but it's easily possible to make yourself better looking. Let me prove the second part of the statement first. You know, a simple Google search makes it very easy that um, to observe that it's possible to make yourself better looking. Um, this uh, are all screenshots from the movie Beauty and the Geek, which has a premise that's too complicated for me to explain here, but it involves taking uh, men who look like that and turning that into men who look like this. And it's very obvious that those men on the right are better looking than the ones on the left, so it's possible to make people better looking. The question, of course, is, you know, can you measure how good looking you are? And I'm going to argue you cannot. You know, I am, as a Patriots fan, I am a uh, strong believer in this statement. Our God is an awesome God. His name is Tom Brady. But, you know, here is a computer-based good looking measurement tool, and they failed to rate Mr. Brady as godlike in any one of two pictures. Obviously, it's not true. Um, let me finally summarize that uh, anesthesia quality has two big challenges. What metric actually tracks performance and how do we track events outside our world? Uh, neither structure nor process does the job. Outcome reporting, I guess, would be the end point, but there are so many things getting in the way. Definition, identification, gaming, unintended consequences. It limits the effectiveness. Nevertheless, performance improvement can be detected in the consistency of hospital performance and in the approach to new outcome signals. Uh, that event reporting can help anesthesiologists uh, identify high-risk, low-frequency uh, events if you know what's coming. It's easier to stop, and you may not be able to measure it, but you can make it better, so don't stop trying. Thank you very much.